Hello, everybody. I'm Howie Hawkins. I was the Green Party candidate and the Socialist Party candidate for president in 2020. And this podcast, Green Socialist Notes, is about continuing to educate and organize around the eco-socialist platform that Angela Walker and I ran on. So I think uh, probably the most important thing that we should be engaged in supporting right now is the UAW strike. It just got expanded a couple days ago, adding two more plants, a 5,700 worker plant in Chicago, Ford Factory, and a 2,300 worker GM plant in Lansing, Michigan. So that's 7,000 more workers now out on strike. It's about 25,000 out of the 150,000 auto workers. So it's 43 plants and warehouses across 21 states on strike. And UAW last week reported some progress with Ford, so they were exempt. This time it's Stellantis where they made progress. So Ford and GM got some major plants struck this week. So that's part of the UAW's uh, escalating tactics. And we've gone over the demands before. I mean, for me, I think the most important thing is getting rid of the tiers. Um, The uh, second tier workers that are coming in, they don't get pensions, they don't get good health care, and they're making about half as much an hour as the senior workers. And that divides the workers and and undermines the uh, living standards of, of, of people in the auto industry. So that's really key. And I hope that the uh, union will push hard and win those things. So, you know, Irish people to get involved. There's a website the UAW has, uh, Stand With Us. We'll put that in the chat. And what they're looking for is people to come and uh, support their pickets. That's particularly important at the uh, smaller parts plants. That's most of the, uh, it's about 38 plants that that are auto parts plants. And, uh, you know, they just... It will help their spirit and, and, and show strength to the company if you can show up and help them pick it. The pickets are going 24 hours 7, so, you know, there's there's no reason why you can't find any time to go out there. And the other thing they're asking people to do is they've got some leaflets you can download and go leaflet dealerships and just show support among the public. And they talk about how to do that. So, um, And then we have an article from Dan Feely that we'll uh, put in the chat too. That's an update, an updated report on strike. So take a look at that. And, uh, you know, let's let's support that strike and see uh, what we can gain from it because it's directly affecting the UAW workers, but it's going to set a tone throughout uh, all of organized labor and, and unorganized labor, the auto plants that are not organized. Uh, if the UAW gets a much better contract and in, that will incentivize those plants to get organized. And as we've talked about, we've been losing ground for 50 years. Um, you know, I pointed out in uh, what the job I used to have with the Teamsters on loading trucks in the warehouse, um, in the early 70s, that paid $10 an hour, which is about $72 an hour now. Uh, before this most recent contract, the starting wage was just over 17, a fraction of what it was. And uh, even the top, even with this contract, the, 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 the drivers who make $49 an hour when they have the seniority, it's still below what uh, an entry-level worker was making at UPS, you know, what now, 50 years ago. So um, we have a lot of lost ground to catch up, and, and this strike can help us do that. And then I was going to talk about the government shutdown, which apparently I haven't got the full news Uh the Congress just voted to uh, for a 45-day continuing resolution, so the government's not going to shut down. That's good. Um, what we have seen is the far-right Republicans trying to use uh, the budget, like they did the debt ceiling crisis, to create a national crisis to force budget concessions for their right-wing agenda. I mean, the debt ceiling crisis, they got a two-year freeze on domestic spending. And uh, without touching military spending. And they were trying to get even more concessions in that direction this time. So this continuing resolution just continues the spending at the current levels, but they still got to deal with it in 45 days. And apparently the far right is really upset with McCarthy, who I guess uh, built a coalition of moderate Republicans and Democrats to get this thing passed. So the far right is going to go after McCarthy's speakership. 
Um, so, you know, while these people throw have their food fights in the Republican Party, you know, the real problems we face are not uh, being addressed. And the one thing I don't know is they separated the Ukraine funding from the rest of the continuing resolution. And I'm not sure whether that will come up as a separate bill or it's going to be revisited in 45 days, but we'll see. Um, but I guess the good news is, and, and the encouraging news is that, you know, instead of submitting to this blackmail by the far right Republicans, you know, most people in Congress said this is crazy. And so they've averted uh, or maybe kicked the can down the road, but uh, at least for 45 days, hundreds of thousands of federal workers and a lot of services people depend on won't be halted. I guess the other thing I want to comment on this week is probably a lot of people haven't paid attention to it, but it's what happened in Nagorno-Karabakh or the Artsakh Republic as the Armenians living there called it. It's a humanitarian disaster. The ethnic Armenians are being driven from a land that they've occupied since several centuries before Christ. And it's a very complicated history. You know, the, the people living in that region in the Caucasus, the Armenians became Christians, the Azerbaijanis became Muslims. That's part of it. But it's, you know, ethnic rivalry. They've been ruled by all kinds of empires from the Russians to the Persians to the Ottoman Empire. Uh, there's a lot of history there. But just the most recent period, when the Soviet Union broke up, the Armenians in the Gorno Karabakh wanted to have an independent republic. Uh, they had been part of the Azerbaijani Soviet Socialist Republic, and they, you know, just felt that uh, they were a minority and an oppressed minority within Azerbaijan. But the Russians didn't want another independent Republican this republic besides Azerbaijan and Armenia, so they supported Azerbaijanis having continued rule. And so Azerbaijan and Armenia fought over this territory and each other in the early 90s as the Soviet Union was, uh, you know, the consequence of it breaking out was being worked out. Both sides are guilty of ethnic cleansing. But Russia brokered a ceasefire in 1994, and it held for about 20 years for the most part. And the Armenians in Nagorno-Karabakh formed a, a democratic republic with their own government. It wasn't recognized by anybody, uh, but it wasn't, uh, it was their government. And, uh, but the war resumed, Azerbaijan attacked in 2016 and again in 2020. Uh, Russia had peacekeepers there that were supposed to maintain the 2020 ceasefire. But about 10 days ago, Azerbaijan mounted a major military uh, operation uh, accompanied by a lot of genocidal rhetoric about the Armenians and uh, the uh, forces of the Nagorno-Karabakh uh, Republic, you know, were no match for that. The Russian peacekeepers weren't either. And so Azerbaijan just took over. It was uh, kind of the blitzkrieg that uh, Russia tried to do to Ukraine at the beginning of the full-scale invasion uh, in February 20. 22, but this time it worked. So now there are 180,000 Armenians. They say over 100,000 have already fled this enclave, which is in Azerbaijan, uh, at one point adjacent to Armenia. They're fleeing to Armenia for safety. Um, so what this means geopolitically in the world is uh, Russia has lost Armenia because of this as a military ally in the CSTO which is you know, Russia's equivalent of NATO. It's the Cooperative Security Treaty Organization, which Armenia was a part of. And uh, NATO's gained an ally. Um, and on the other side, Azerbaijan is now allied with Russia. Um, not that that means much to the Armenians who are, who are facing this ethnic cleansing. And I, you know, there's not much we can do about this. Uh, but in terms of progressive politics, it shows that ethnic and religious sectarianism and nationalism are a huge obstacle to the kind of multi-party or multicultural democracy and multi-party democracy that we on the left advocate, and therefore to peace and equality among different ethnic and religious groups. So I think the best thing we can do is uh, improve the U.S., 
and make it more of a true multicultural democracy that sets a good example and shows that it can work. Um, and that does have power in the world. You know, a lot of people want to come to here in Western Europe because there's more freedom from the repressive uh, situation a lot of people find themselves in in other countries, as well as the poverty. So um, I think our strongest foreign policy is to set a good example domestically to advance democracy in the world. You can't, you can't advance it at the point of a gun. And, uh, you know, the U.S. needs to figure that out instead of being a global military empire. So I just wanted to note that it's, it's a real tragedy. It's not going to get a lot of attention in the world. There's a lot of other going on, a lot of other things going on, but it, it, you know, it's really sad that that's happening to those Armenians who in the 20th and 21st century have suffered uh, genocide and, and oppression. So I'll leave it at that. And, uh, Let's talk about the issues. Looking for your questions and answers, uh, questions and comments, or your answers. Put your comments in the chat. Chris Blankenholm, we're the only country that lets these games with debt happen. Only us and Denmark even have a debt ceiling. And Dem Denmark doesn't let it come to the brink like we do. Yeah, this, you know, the damn Democrats had a majority in both houses in the first two years of Biden's administration. And they could have fixed this, except they wouldn't challenge the filibuster, which gives the right wing a veto. It's been that, it's been that way since the Dixiecrats and the Southern uh, Democrats have had that extra power in the Senate, that veto power the filibuster gives them. It's been an obstacle to civil rights like it was during the first two years of the Biden administration. And it was to this debt ceiling nonsense. And, uh, you know, it just goes to show, you know, if we, we if we rely on the Democrats to solve these problems, they're not going to get solved. You know, as I've said many times, bipart um, Biden pursues bipartisanship with these neo-fascist Republicans, which only normalizes and legitimizes them and gives them that veto power because he wouldn't challenge the filibuster. So there are a lot of things that that's ceiling one of many that you know could easily be resolved if uh, the Democrats had any backbone, but it makes you wonder if not a lot of the neoliberal corporate center of the Democratic Party really agrees with the Republicans more than they will let on. Amy L. Sachs, Howie, I'm not sure if you can get Jason Call on the show at some point. He's an ex-Dem who is running for Congress in Washington State. Yeah, Matthew O put me and him in touch and Jason said he would call me. And that was several weeks ago. So I, I'll tell you what I'll do. I will follow up with him. And, you know, I the point was just to talk about his campaign, but, uh, you know, it be, might be good to get him on the show. Um, there are a couple of other candidates that I've talked to about coming on. And so that may happen, you know, where are we now? Almost October. If it's going to have any impact on the campaigns this year, it should happen soon. So we'll see. Frankie Lee, we need more strikes overall. A wildcat trucker strike would be great. Um, yeah, uh, if the truckers are organized, uh, wildcat strike, you know, requires organization. I mean, what a wildcat is, is a, it's, Going on strike, even though a union contract or if it's just, uh, you know, working at will by, by truckers with a private employer that don't have a contract, um, you know, if they're not organized so that they all go out and are in solidarity, the employers will just pick off the strikers one by one. So, but more labor action in general and not just strikes, but, you know, organization on the shop floor. Uh, where you resist uh, unfair work rules, unsafe work practices, um, disrespect from supervisors. I mean, all those things can be contested and help build the organization, which can lead to a union or strengthen a union if you've got one. So, you know, there's a lot more labor activity that could be done, and we need to rebuild a culture at work of worker solidarity and organization 
and pushback against employers. Right now, employers, you know, we have about 5% of the private sector organized in unions. So everybody, most people are, you know, it's them against the big company. And they don't have the bargaining power they would if they were organized and doing collective bargaining or at least working together to improve conditions of work, even if they don't have a union yet. So, yeah, labor activity, a labor movement. Um, there's a you know network called Labor Notes, which I've been linked to. It's been around since the 70s. It is where a lot of the uh, best things happen in the labor movement uh, have come out of Teams for a Democratic Union. Um, this new uh, UAWD, Uniting All Workers for Democracy, uh, which is the new leadership of the UAW. Um, that's a whole story in itself. I hope to have a retired auto worker I know who's been active in that whole period since Labor Notes and, and some of these uh, independent socialists uh, got jobs in industry and began organizing back in the 70s. Uh, she's been through it all and She's in United Auto Workers for Democracy, or United, United All Workers for Democracy, UAWD. Um, so she knows that whole story. So I hope, uh, in fact, it's Diane Feely, whose article we linked to. She's been writing updates about the strike on about a weekly basis. Um, so, you know, maybe we can talk more about that if we can get her on. So I think she'll come on. I, I did email her this week, but I don't think she saw the email. So I'll just give her a call. Scott Trooper 164, I just read somewhere that California may be allowing $20 as minimum wage. Good starting point or more could have been done um, for fast food workers? Um, well, at this point, I think the goal should be more. Um, you you want to ramp it up so businesses have the opportunity to plan for the increases uh, you don't want to hit them with a, a big jump right away uh, that, that you know, may uh, put those businesses in jeopardy and, and actually cost jobs. But uh, $20 an hour doesn't buy what it used to. And, uh, you know, if the real minimum wage had kept uh, pace with inflation from where it was, I think, in 1969, when it peaked in real terms, it'd be something like $28 an hour now. So. You know, that's progress, but we need more. <coughs> See, Manny, Sean Doherty is running green in California. Mentions tricky ballot access rules that almost got greens knocked off California ballot. Ray, need to vote in green primaries. Can you explain in which states have this? Um, I think the thing in, in California is... The deadlines uh, to get placed on the ballot are early. They're coming up right now. I think this weekend, the California Green Party State Committee is meeting uh, so they can uh, make some recommendations to the Secretary of State as to who should be on their uh, presidential primary ballot. So I think the issue in California is the deadlines for this stuff is, is very early. And if you're going to run for office, you got to know all those rules even if they're not uh, reasonable or fair. Um, but if you know them, at least you know what you need to meet. Um, so that's the best I can tell you. And, you know, every state, there are 51 jurisdictions counting D.C. that govern ballot access, both in terms of internal party primaries and general elections. And, you know, there should be federal standards I remember Ralph Nader talking about how the ACLU put forward model legislation in like 1948 when Henry Wallace was running as a progressive and the Democrats were trying to prevent him from being on a ballot in several states. And that would set a minimum standard of fairness in terms of number of signatures and, and uh, filing deadlines and so forth. And, you know, Congress still should do that. Um, there was a bill, the last good bill, was from John Conyers, the Democrat progressive from uh, Detroit, Michigan. And his bill was in 1989. 
um, it's pretty pathetic that, you know, progressive Democrats have not made that an issue. Um, so, you know, they just seem to be concerned, well, I, they can get on a Democratic ballot to hell with everybody else. And that's not very damn Democratic, small d. Um, and, but I also blame the, the left, you know. The Green Party's made it a pretty high emphasis, these electoral reforms, but not most of the ideological, the socialist left, uh, nor the, uh, you know, progressive left, like progressive Democrats from, uh, from America or the Democratic Socialists of America who work inside the Democratic Party. Um, you know, we really need a multi-party democracy. So the left has its fair share of representation in, in government. That would totally change the political dynamics of this country. I mean, what we got now is the progressives who go into the Democratic Party, you know, they raise a few issues in the primaries and then they're silenced. And when they get into office, they've always had a, you know, a coterie of, uh, you know, small coterie of 50 or 25 you know, pretty strong progressives. Um, and this goes back, you know, years and years and years. It's not just the squad recently. But they get nothing done. They are more window dressing for the corporate Democrats, make the Democrats look better than they are. They're having any real power. They just don't have the leverage. Uh, corporate Democrats call the shots, determine who gets on what committees, who gets money from the National Party for their campaigns. And it's a lot of leverage over these progressives. So, um, it's something you would think the progressives in the Democratic Party, as well as the radicals outside of it, would have figured out by now and prioritized, but they haven't. And uh, fortunately, there are, there are a lot of more good government types that are pushing for ranked choice voting, and in some cases, proportional ranked choice voting, which leads to proportional representation in legislative bodies. And that's really transformational. Um, and as I've been repeating you know, since I ran in 2020, that needs to be, be a priority for us as Greens and leftists. Uh, that will create a multi-party democracy, give the left a, a, a legitimate, normalized place in politics, give us a platform from which to make our arguments. And I think on our issues, whether it's Medicare for all or the Green New Deal or taxing the rich, we'll win those arguments. And if, you know, the Democrats don't move our way, people are going to start electing us. Uh, so, you know, electoral reform needs to be a top priority. And uh, and in California, watch for those early deadlines. Doherty was on Savvy Savs, and he said Bernie Sanders almost got Greens knocked off ballot because so many Greens switched to them to vote for him. And this almost backfired. Need to warn Green voters. Um, yeah, in California in particular, uh, the Sanders campaign did uh, organize, they had an organized campaign to get people to switch uh, from Green to Democrat to vote for Bernie in primaries. And they got a significant number of people to do. The Greens did lose uh, some of their registration in California, and they didn't get it back after Bernie left. Probably the most famous example is Gail McLaughlin, the Green mayor of Richmond, California, who said, to the Greens when she was arguing, you know, switch Democratic so you can vote for Bernie and then you can switch back, I plan to, and then she didn't. Um, so that was not a good move by Bernie Sanders and he's never been an advocate for electoral reform and that's, you know, a negative on his balance sheet. Uh, you know, I think he's been a very good uh, spokesperson for, for good reforms like Medicare for All, but uh, when it comes to uh, democratic reforms in our electoral system, he's not had anything to say. And it's, uh, it's uh, like I said, it's a problem with the whole left. They, they kind of accept the rules that we've been given, even though they're biased against the left. And it's, it's not that hard to see if you think about it and, you know, look at the electoral system, but it just hasn't been a priority and it should be. via email, comments on the writer's skill winning a contract after striking for 148 days. Um, well, I'm glad they won. 
Um, I'm, I haven't followed that one closely. Um, so I assume that uh, the bargaining, the bargainers for the union have approved it, but it has to be voted on by the members. Uh, that's what I expect. That would be the normal thing. Uh, and I don't know the details, um, but I know they had real issues and, you know, I, I wish them well and uh, hopefully it's a strong contract and, and will inspire other segments of the labor movement. But uh, that's one I haven't followed closely, so I don't really have much to say about it. Beloved community, Turkey and Israel supplied the arms for the ethnic cleansing of Armenians, genocide of Armenians by the Turks has a long and bloody history. You're absolutely right about that. I, I meant to mention that when I was discussing that. Uh, Turkey and Israel were the main suppliers of Azerbaijan's uh, military, which beefed up and, and just overwhelmed the Gorno Karabakh. And, uh, you know, they, all, they both had their geopolitical reasons that have nothing to do with human rights of anybody, Azerbaijanis or Armenians. And that's part of the tragedy that, you know, I was saying about this. So, yeah, you're right. Turkey and Israel uh, played a part in this ethnic cleansing of the Armenians. And the Turks, I mean, what they did to the Armenians after World War I is, was genocide, and they still won't acknowledge that or apologize for it. And, uh, you know, Turkey is an autocratic, uh, you know, sectarian religious government um, that is uh, intolerant of Armenians and especially Kurds these days. So it's uh, not a good player in the world. It's another capitalist, imperialistic uh, power that uh, longs for the good old days of the Ottoman Empire, I guess. Scout Trooper 164, I think the Writers Guild may be going up against video games next since they voted overwhelmingly to do so. Hope them well. Um, yeah, I do know that uh, AI and uh, what do they call it? You know, uh, deep fakes, you know, video creations that look real uh, are a big concern to them. I think one of the things they were asking for is that uh, actors' images cannot be used without compensation by artificial intelligence producing programming. Uh, I think that was a big issue for them. And uh, you say they're going up against video games next. Uh, I'm not sure what that means, if that means the next contract or uh, they're going to go on strike on that or what. But, you know, uh, video games using actors' images uh, could be a problem, you know, and, and as those things get more realistic, the, the actors become uh, secondary, I guess, you know, the, the, the creativity is in, in using those images, but not putting the words in the mouth of the actors or the, the acting in the hands of the actors. I think they are going to focus on unionizing the video game industry, which brought in $350 billion in 2020, 2022. Okay. Um, then that's, that's an unorganized sector and that's what the unions need to be doing, organizing the unorganized. So I wish them well. And uh, I guess I need to get more up on what's going on in that industry. It's, it's not something I've really been involved in you know, in any way, really, except, you know, going on news programs or public affairs programs and this little social media stuff we do. But it's um, something I should probably know a lot more about. Z Manny, I'm hearing 2024 might be a unique opportunity with such weak duopoly front runners, plus a famous West running green, green could possibly reach double digit plurality like with Perot and break duopoly. Uh, I hope so, but I, you know, let's uh, be realistic. Um, you know, Perot was winning before he dropped out in the middle of that campaign in 1992. And I guess it was late July and didn't get back in until October. He still got 19%. He was winning 
he was creaming both uh, who was it, Clinton and uh, and Bush, the incumbent. Um, you know, George H.W. Bush. So Perot was in a lot stronger position. He had a lot more money. Uh, the media was giving him a lot more positive coverage. That was a time when, you know, Perot's balanced budget stuff and uh, anti-NAFTA stuff uh, had a certain resonance. And he was kind of like uh, Trump. He was a kind of larger-than-life figure that, that got people to watch uh, TV or buy newspapers. Um, West is not at that level, although he's probably the most famous green we've run since Ralph Nader. Um, I think the, the weakness of the duopoly front runners uh, does break in our way. Um, I understand that uh, Robert F. Kennedy Jr. is going to announce he's running independent tomorrow. Uh, and he's polling, well, this is from the YouGov poll that was commissioned by Nick Bryan's People's Party. Uh, if he's up against West, Biden, and Trump, Kennedy got 17% according to their poll. So he's even more famous with a more famous name. Um, so who knows what's going to happen? I think, you know, what we want to do is support a candidate that supports our positions and, uh, you know, vote for that. And, uh, but it's, it's strange times. Um, it's, you know, how the media is going to cover it is going to be so big, how social media deals with it. Uh, there's going to be a larger dynamic to this thing that really over uh, determines what the candidates themselves do. So it's, it's a volatile situation, although I think the default is it'll come back to a anybody but Trump vote for uh, – most of the center and progressive side of the political spectrum. And that's going to be Biden if people aren't, even if they're not enthusiastic. Uh, I think that's a larger dynamic, but, you know, it could change. I mean, Biden's health is not assured. Trump's uh, ability to run with all these court cases he's facing, there's still a lot up in the air. So it's really hard to make predictions. Um, but I think, you know, you, you don't go on, you know, what not Las Vegas is betting. You go on what's right. And that means to support a candidate with a program we like and, and, and work for that and work for that program. Thoughts on Nader's support for Biden. You've spoken of some ongoing disagreements with Nader, Ray, the role of Greens. Can you speak to the history of that? Plus your thoughts now. Well, yeah, there was an interview. Ralph has said, he said this on Democracy Now!, that the headline wasn't accurate. And what Ralph made clear, he, he said in that interview, but also on Democracy Now!, that the Democrats should not be attacking Cornell West ballot access. So he's defending uh, the uh, right of third parties to run. He wished the Greens well, although I know he's skeptical of us, given our organizational uh, weaknesses and incompetencies. And, you know, I can't blame him for that. Um, disagreements with Nader, I've not really had major disagreements with him on approaches. He has supported independent politics. He was friendly to my campaign in 2020, but also trying to influence the Democrats to run a more progressive populist kind of program that would mobilize their base and cut into the uh, Trump base of Obama Trump or uh, Sanders Trump voters. And, you know, he thought Biden should be able to landslide uh, Trump and defeat that MAGA Republican uh, politics once and for all. That's what he was hoping. Um, so, you know, what he's saying is Biden is the most realistic support uh, possibility to defeat Trump. Uh, that's probably true if you're betting on Las Vegas. But I disagree with him that, uh, well, let's put it this way. I'm supporting uh, an independent, progressive, or socialist candidate uh, for president because I want to vote for the, the things I believe in. And that vote is my voice. And if I silence that to get behind Biden, I just give away my voice and my support 
for things like Medicare for all and a Green New Deal, which Biden is very explicit. He's opposed to both of those things. Well, you know, I'm going to vote for what I want. And the more votes we get, the more leverage we have going forward. Uh, at least, you know, my little voice in the voting booth is, you know, all I got and I'm going to use it. Via email, thoughts on the first Trump co-defendant in Georgia pleading guilty. Uh, I didn't see that. Um, and if they pled guilty, they're they're cutting the deal and they probably have to testify against Trump. Now, that's Georgia. That's the uh, meddling in the Georgia election. Uh, so I think that's good news for the prosecution and bad news for Trump. And that's good news as far as I'm concerned. Zimani, is it true that our membership in the World Trade Organization ties the government's hands legally and forces them to enact corporate friendly policies? Is this a kind of straitjacket on us? Should we exit the WTO? See Silent Coup BK, see the Silent Coup book. Um, well, yeah, the WTO uh, sets up trade rules, which gives corporations and governments the ability to uh, challenge. Uh, trade and corporate practices that violate those rules, but not labor unions, environmentalists, and so forth. And they have these uh, trade tribunals, which are uh, conducted in secret, out of public view, without public uh, testimony. And so, uh, you know, like, for example, uh, when we banned fracking in New York, uh, the oil companies were threatening to get somebody like Canada to sue us. Uh, for violating uh, fair trade practices. So it does intrude on our ability to uh, set up our own rules and regulations in our own governments. So that's a big problem with the World Trade Organization. Uh, should we exit WTO? The other question is, should we try to reform it? And I think at this point, we should use our leverage, which is big, I mean, us being the US, uh, to make the trade regime more fair more fair uh, and more um, open to and protective of labor and environmental uh, issues or, or conditions. Um, so I think, you know, if we exit the WTO, that kind of leads us out of the main organization setting these trade rules. And I don't think that's probably the best idea because they'll go about their merry way. There are plenty of other capitalist countries around the world. They'd be happy to, you know, take the place of, the U.S. Uh, in trade. So I think we should, uh, and what we need is a progressive government that wants to do that. The problem is now we don't have that. Um, one example, I, I, you know, I'm in the Ukraine Solidarity uh, Network and we're working on uh, building a campaign for canceling Ukraine's foreign debt so they can use it to maintain care for the Ukrainian people and fight the war and then rebuild the country after the war. And Ukraine is a maybe the northernmost country of the global south. They're caught in a debt trap, trap, which uh, the kleptocratic oligarchs that have ruled Ukraine for so long got them in. And uh, so it's an unfair debt. Um, and, you know, they've got some relief. The international bondholders, you know, like BlackRock and J.P. Morgan have agreed to a two-year moratorium on payments. I think the bondholders realized that Ukraine was going to uh, have a debt default, so you know couldn't pay it anyway, so they added that moratorium. But the multinational, multilateral institutions, the IMF, which has the most debt, the World Trade Organization, and the European Commission have not given any debt relief, not even a moratorium for a while during this war. Um, and that's where, you know, the U.S. has leverage, not in the European Commission, but certainly in the World Bank and the IMF. And uh, now there was a law passed in May after the war, the full scale invasion started in Congress that instructed the Treasury Department to work in those two institutions, the IMF and the World Bank, uh, to provide debt relief to uh, Ukraine. But I think it's one of those laws that passed and then nothing was done. 
we're trying to, you know, find out. We're asking people in the government, you know, has anything been done on that? What have we said in those meetings about this issue? And, uh, you know, I haven't been able to find out anything yet. Uh, but that's a case where, you know, the WTO, World Bank, IMF are, you know, the multilateral institutes managing global capitalism on a neoliberal model, which is bad for most of the people in the world. And so, you know, the question is, can we get a progressive U.S. government to use its considerable weight in those institutions to change those policies? And I think that's where we got to go instead of just uh, walking out and leaving that to other capitalist countries. See, Manny, I wouldn't try to reform something like WTO. It seems analogous to, to reform a corporate duopoly party versus exiting it and pushing back with an independent alternative. The corporate aspect is too strong. Well, that's kind of what BRICS is trying to do, but they are totally caught up in the neoliberal multilateral management of global capitalism by the IMF and the World Bank. Um, so... You know, countries like China in particular has, you know, used its growing weight in those institutions to support this neoliberal agenda because they are, you know, profiting from it as well as a creditor country to many countries around the world. And they also get together probably most ominously in the United Nations Framework uh, Convention on Climate Change where at the COP conferences, the Council of the Council of the Parties, the Global Climate Conferences, you know, China, Russia, the U.S., Saudi Arabia get together and prevent real uh, goals and, and, and caps on carbon emissions. Um, you know, what was the last thing? They, they didn't want to say we're going to phase out coal, we're going to do something else with it, but it was just not really dealing with the issue. They... So what I'm saying is um, even the BRICS, which are supposed to be, you know, kind of the uh, pushback by the second tier countries are really acting as sub-imperialist countries. So the U.S. and the Europeans and the Japanese were the sort of the most uh, powerful of the capitalist countries in the world economy. Um, so how would you do that? I mean, okay, the United States pulls out. What other progressive countries are there that would, fight against the system. Um, I, I, you know, I think you're better off, you know, fighting within and making it a public issue so people around the world join you <clears throat> and get their governments to join you. <clears throat> Via email, thoughts on Amazon suit filed by the feds in 17 states. Well, I'm glad to see it, um, and this is an issue. I haven't read the details. I don't know uh, what they're asking as a remedy, um, whether it's, you know, antitrust. Uh, I think that we need to be looking at socialization of these platforms that become monopolized. You know, Amazon is uh, basically a shopping app, and these platforms tend to monopolize because People want to get on the app with the most people on it because <coughs> that's where the most information is <coughs> and the most possibilities for, you know, interaction, whether it's Facebook or Amazon. So maybe those should be public utilities regulated democratically by public, by the public through the government. So I haven't looked into the details of that. Uh, what commentary I have read says it's going to be a difficult suit to win, given who's in the courts now and the, the case law on any trust as it's developed over the last several decades. Um, but I'm glad to see they're trying, trying to do something about it. And, uh, you know, we'll have to see what happens. <clears throat> Vicki Corden, I heard people living in swing states should not vote third parties because of the spoiler issue. Your thoughts? Yeah, and then people go a step further and saying, okay, vote for Cornell West in the 
states that are not competitive, but where it's competitive, swing states vote for Biden. You know, if Cornell West were to adopt that policy, he'd lose all his leverage because he's basically saying, I'm not really competing with you. And what Biden hears is, I don't need to give any concessions to the progressive left because they're not serious. They're not competing for votes where it counts. Um, so I think that's, you know, terrible from the point of view of left-wing politics. You know, our power, our voice is our vote. And if we give it away where it may make a difference, who's going to take us seriously? We're not really fighting for what we believe. So I, I think you're going to hear a lot of that in this election, and I just hope, you know, the West campaign doesn't succumb to that. Heather Mary Quain, I want to vote my conscience in French, it French, and I respect that are in the UAW say we must defeat Trump by any means because he will be worse than Biden. What are your thoughts? Well, the UAW hasn't endorsed yet. They don't like Trump. They made that clear this week. But Biden hasn't gotten their endorsement yet, which is basically saying, UAW is saying, you got to show us more before you get our endorsement. And that's what they ought to be doing. They ought to be making demands. I think it's terrible that Sanders and the squad have all lined up with Biden, didn't make any demands on him. There was no progressive, you know, credible progressive challenge inside the Democratic uh, Party to neoliberal Biden, which means the progressives, you know, didn't even fight this time. And what that does is just encourage Biden to move to the right as he is, whether it's immigration or permitting new fossil fuel projects or accepting a debt ceiling deal that freezes domestic spending for two years. Um, you know, he he's not getting challenged. And uh, so I will give the UAW credit for saying, uh, you know, we appreciate your support coming out to the picket line, but uh, we're not ready to endorse you. We got to see more. I don't know exactly what they're demanding of Biden. I don't know what they've talked about, but I think you don't give away your endorsement before the whole process is, you know, where it's just getting started. So, you know, that I that I think is to the UAW's credit and to the discredit of progressives who folded up tents and lined up behind Biden before the election even started. <clears throat> Amy L. Sachs, what gets lost in the whole idea of swing states is how often we have terrible neoliberal policy here, too. Look at how my city's gross mayor and awful city council treats the poor and homeless. Um, and we're supposed to be blue, laugh out loud. We have plenty of sucky politicians who play at compassion but only care about rich people and corporations. Yeah. Um, and the swing states are presumably purple. They could go red or blue. Um, but, um, you know, that's those are the states where the left has leverage because they might be the margin of difference. And use that leverage to get some things for the Democrats really don't want to do. Um, and, you know, except for those flashy progressives that we know about, like Sanders and the squad, most Democrats are, very pro-business. Um, you know, just one example, I think I talked about this after the climate march, but AOC got up there at the last rally and bragged about what we had done in New York and passed this Build Public Renewables Act, which she made sound like all renewables are going to be public goods. And that's not what passed. What passed was uh, say, a bill saying that uh, the New York Power Authority can build renewables if the private industry doesn't want to do it. In other words, if it's unprofitable, then we can have lemon socialism, which is subsidized by the public, um, which means not a lot of these renewable projects are going to be public. And there was a bill called, uh, uh, was it Build? No, the uh, Utility Democracy Act, which would have brought all uh, distribution or power distribution utilities in New York under public power with locally elected boards governing them. 
and that didn't pass. And, and the provision that would have allowed public power, New York Power Authority to have first right of refusal on those renewable projects instead of picking up what private industry doesn't want was in the bill, but it was deleted by the corporate Democrats. And of course, the Utility Democracy Act, which would have socialized uh, public power industry or the power industry and made it public power, uh, didn't get anywhere. But there she is bragging about what New York had done when at that rally of all places, she, she should have been saying we needed to do more. Um, so I, I just, you know, it really bugs me when, you know, the progressives that get a high profile, you know, mislead the people like that. And instead of saying we need to demand more, they're saying uh, we need to do what we did in New York, which is not what we need. It drives me crazy. Heather Mary Quain, what happened to AOC and the squad and Bernie, who was pulling the strings? Why did they mostly give up on us? Um, I wouldn't say Bernie is telling uh, you know AOC and Ilhan Omar and uh, uh, Rakita she Rakita Talib and the rest what to do. Um, I think they think for themselves. I think we ought to give them that respect. But I think they think alike with Bernie. Um, and when you say give up on us, I think that means, and I think it's correct, that they're giving up on the power of popular movements. And they're relying on their own position in high places to be the difference. And in this case, their ability to influence Biden behind closed doors, which is nil. I mean, Biden felt when, you know, coming off the strong Sanders primary in 2020, he had to give something to the progressives. That's why he had those commissions that are committees that had people from both the Sanders campaign and the Biden campaign coming out with uh, jointly agreeable positions. Now, mostly they conceded to Biden and they were short, but they were better than the kind of stuff we're getting from Biden now because the progressives have, they're, they're playing the inside game instead of, as Bernie said when he was running, you know, uh, you know, we need a political revolution that depends on the people remaining active and pushing. And that's not what we're seeing from those progressives in the Democratic Party right now. And that's what I, that's why I think you're right. They gave up on us. They gave up on the movement. And they think, uh, you know, they can do it on the inside, but they can't do anything on the inside without uh, a real strong push from the outside. And they seem to be losing sight of that. Z Manny, any updates, Ray, preparing legislation to restore New York State ballot access? You said a specialized lawyer could do this in a day. Is it worth just hiring such a person? Um, yeah, if we could hire a lawyer, that would help a lot. Um, but we don't have the money in the Green Party to do that. Uh, I can't update you any more than to say that, you know, we got an electoral reform working group that is working with legislators to come up with uh, legislation. And if there's anybody in New York listening to this that wants to be involved, uh, let me know. You know, I, you can contact me through my old campaign site or through the uh, Green Socialist Organizing Project website. I think both of them have contact pages where you can write a message. And I'll get back to you on that. Um, we need more energy. I think right now there's... Uh, not a lot of energy in the Green Party in New York, given what they did to the ballot access uh, and larger dynamics going on. So uh, we could use help. We could use energy. And if anybody knows a lawyer that would want to do this pro bono, uh, you know, definitely refer them to us. Z Manny, Bernie and the squad are dictating to their base instead of listening to it. And in this respect, they act like pseudopod for corporate dem center to colonize and pacify progressive movements. Um, I think that's largely right, unfortunately. And, uh, you know, the left that uh, relates to them, like DSA, same thing. They, they're committed to the Democratic Party now, and uh, the Democratic Party takes them for granted. To welcome them, you know, going out and knocking on doors for their candidates. But, 
you know, the, the programs that DSA not only stands for uh, don't get much play. And in New York, you know, they were very involved in that public power stuff that I just described. And, you know, they're calling defeat, as I described it, a victory. And, uh, you know, that reminds me of Amakar Cabral's famous slogan that uh, he was a African liberation uh, theorist from Guinea-Bissau, and he said, tell no lies, claim no easy victories. You got to tell the truth to the people, or else when they find out you're lying to them, you lose them. Vicki Corden, here in Florida, are expected to renew voter registration every year. Oh, Jesus. Death Sanctus has a voter suppression going on. So I didn't realize that. You got to re-register every year to vote. Um, that, yeah, that will definitely reduce the number of people qualified to vote. Um, I, I'm, I think I would have heard of that, though. I mean, they may be, you got to re-register if you move to another county. Yeah, I understand that. But, um, I mean, after you vote, you lose your registration, and you got to go back and register for the next election. If that's what's going on, that's really bad. Heather Mary Queen, sorry, last question. Don't apologize for asking questions. We like questions. Why can the right call Biden a socialist? Does the MAGA folk believe this? What does this do to the progressive movement? Yeah, this has been going on since uh, Fox News was calling Obama a socialist. In fact, although Bernie gets a lot of credit for popularizing the word socialist when he ran in 2016 in particular, I think Fox News kind of seeded the, the field for that by calling Obama a socialist. And so people that liked Obama, you know, liberal-minded people said, well, maybe I'm a socialist. It kind of took the edge off that, uh, you know, that uh, smear or that invective. And, uh, yeah, I mean, Trump calls... The Democrats, you know, radical, Marxist, communist, fascist. He calls them every ism, you know, that doesn't sound good he can think of. Um, do the MAGA folk believe this? Yeah, because um, they don't, they're like living in an alternative reality. They've gone down these conspiracy rabbit holes and, you know, QAnon and those kinds of things. And uh, they just believe what, what Trump says without really thinking about it or without wanting to think about it. And what does this do to the progressive movement? Um, I don't think it hurts people who consider themselves socialist. I mean, you know, the right wing calling us names is nothing new. Um, it does intimidate the more moderate Democrats because they think it will hurt them. But those of us on the left, I mean, what we should, you know, say is, yes, we're socialists. And it, you know, what does it mean? It means a full economic as well as political democracy. It means we get the full value of the uh, that our labor produces instead of having somebody who didn't work for it but owns the company taking some of what we produce, some of the value we produce, stealing from us. Um, so, you know, it's it's... It means, you know, people's basic needs will be taken care of, no questions asked. Um, and so I, I think, you know, if we talk to people about that, what it really is, uh, break it down for people, um, a lot of people are going to say, yeah, that sounds pretty good. Z Manny, you wrote a very good book, Ray Democratizing a Party, so it serves as rank and file base. We should hear more about that and your great discussion on Book TV about it on YouTube. Okay, that was uh, what's the name of the book? It came out as an ebook based on an essay I wrote, um, which is called uh, "The Case for an Independent Left Party." At least that was the title in the uh, in the in when it was originally published in International Socialist Review. Um, and I think Chris is putting the link to it on the, on the chat. Um, yeah, I think maybe, uh, 
that would be a good topic for, you know, a presentation at the beginning of one of these. You know, just go over, you know, what I argued in that book. And uh, it's uh, it's too late to do it now or even summarize it now. But it's basically saying that uh, to really try to boil it down. If we don't speak up for ourselves, nobody else will. If we don't act for ourselves, nobody else will. And, uh, you know, relying on the Democratic Party to do it for us is, you know, I've called it political ventriloquism. <laughs> like you're trying to get these people that don't even like you to say what you want them to say and do what you want them to do. And it doesn't work. You know, we need to build our own organization and power and have our own voice and go directly to the people, not try to influence these Democrats who then go to the people and, uh, you know, say and do not what we would. So we need to act for ourselves, you know, working in oppressed people need their own party. They can't rely on a corporate funded Democrats or Republicans. So yeah, let's put that in the list of things to do one of these times. It's a good suggestion. Okay, so I saw Chris uh, put the link to the, both the YouTube discussion and the, uh, the, the book itself, which is free online. And uh, I see more questions that we didn't get to. Another one from Heather Mary Quain. Let's, yeah. Okay, well, uh, I'll briefly deal with that. Uh, we usually limit these to an hour, but uh, we can go a little longer. Uh, and anarchists, I mean, it originated as a trend within the broader socialist movement. And what they were really talking about, in contrast to Marx and Engels, was a decentralized federalist structure of governance of both political questions and the economy. So it was a bottom-up federation, uh, as opposed to Marx and Engels, who most of the time talked about seizing power, centralizing power in the state to suppress capitalism and the counter-revolution. Um, now, both anarchists and Marxian socialists believe in the end, you get rid of the state as a separate administrative institution over the people, and it, it becomes just a very directly democratic system of administration. Um, the anarchists argued they call themselves the libertarian wing of socialism as opposed to what they call the authoritarian wing. Um, so they believe that the, the, the revolutionary movement itself could suppress the counter-revolution and build uh, this more democratic structure from the bottom up. Um, so, but they both rely, you know, the anarchists, you know, took a lot from Marx in terms of his critique of how capitalism functions and exploits people um, and how it creates economic crises. I mean, there wasn't much pushback from anarchists on those questions. It was more a question of how to organize in the revolutionary strategy. So I, I think uh, that's the difference. And I lean more toward the anarchist tradition. Um, there was a time around the Paris Commune, which in 1871 set up a very uh, decentralized federative structure for the Commune of Paris, which means municipality. So they had a council, but it was... Uh, dependent on mandated and recallable delegates from citizen assemblies in the sections or neighborhoods of Paris. And both, you know, anarchists like Bakunin and Kropotkin and Marxists like Marx said that is the alternative. That is, Marx said that's the uh, proletarian state. And the anarchists said that's the uh, revolutionary government that's not a state. But Aside from differences in terminology, they both like that. Although Marx and Engels in subsequent writing went back to a more centralized statist vision of uh, the first stage of socialism. So that in a, in a nutshell is some of the differences. Um, but given where we are now, where we're trying to just, you know, build a genuinely socialist movement, whether it's, you know, anarchists or, you know, democratic socialists, uh, who are more reforming the existing state, and revolutionary socialists who 
are skeptical that can be done. I mean, just building an anti-capitalist analysis and popular movements is something I think we can all agree to do. Um, and over time, you know, in broad social formations, we can debate these issues of strategy and hopefully come to a greater consensus on what to do uh, when the time comes. So it's a big question. That's a short answer, but I think we have to leave it there today. Okay, everybody. Well, thanks for being here. Thank you for your questions. Uh, there's so much to talk about, and we just try to keep it to an hour so it doesn't become a big burden, but it's something you can handle given everybody's busy schedules. Um, I think next week I'll be able to get Diane Feeling on, and uh, I hope to, um, and we'll talk about the UAW strike in more detail and, uh, you know, whatever else is coming up this week. So everybody have a good week. See if you can't support the auto workers. Uh, wherever you are, I, I forgot. I neglected to mention there's a map on that UAW. Uh, what, what is the name of the stand with? Was it stand with auto workers or stand up? Stand with, stand with us. That page the UAW has. They have a map of where all the plants that are being struck are. So uh, you know you can find out how you might be able to plug into that. And uh, otherwise, have a good week, and we'll see you next week.